I'm Jimmy Ferguson of the Lawson Road Church of Christ in Jonesboro, Arkansas. You know, one of the most intriguing and exciting studies found in the Word of God is the subject of heaven. And as a matter of fact, the Bible has a great deal to say about the subject of heaven. For example, we read in Hebrews 11 and verse 10 that its builder and maker is God. And in Revelation chapters 21 and 22, we find further descriptive terms and phrases used in reference to this majestic city of God. For example, the walls of the city are garnished with all manner of precious stones, such as emeralds and sapphires and topaz and sardius and others. We read that the city has no need of the sun or the moon to give it its light, for the glory of God gives it its light. And we read that the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeds from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And these descriptive terms and phrases is the Holy Spirit's way of conveying to our minds that heaven is a place that is far, far more beautiful than anything that you and I could ever imagine. But there's another descriptive term that is used in reference to heaven, a term that we oftentimes use in our own conversations about this wonderful and beautiful biblical subject. And that is that heaven is a better place. That's the term that is used in Hebrews 11 and verse 16. The writer is writing about the great heroes of faith and he says they desire a better country. A better country. A better place. Yes, heaven is a better place. And it is the ultimate goal of every child of God. Oh, how we long to go to heaven. How we want to be there and to spend eternity with there and to spend eternity there with God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, the angelic host of heaven, and the redeemed of the ages. Paul wrote to his Colossian brethren in Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. For Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affections on things above, not on things that are on the earth. In just a short time before his own crucifixion, before his own death and ascension into heaven, Jesus told his apostles in John 14, verses 2 and 3, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Don't you know that must have been a great source of encouragement to them? It must have been a great comfort to them as he spoke to them about that wonderful place that he was going to prepare for them. And he wrote to the Corinthians, Paul did, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, that is, this physical body, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And the more we read and the more we study about heaven, the more we want to go there. And the more we learn about heaven, the more we want to know, the more we want to learn. Let's think about this for just a few moments. A number of reasons why heaven is a better place. Heaven is a better place because we will see Christ. Oh, think of the wonderful and glorious privilege of being able to see Jesus Christ, to fall down at His feet, and to worship Him, and to give Him praise and adoration, and to express our gratitude for the great sacrifice that He made so that we could spend eternity there with Him in heaven. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8, and he stated to them that he was willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Paul actually had a desire to leave this physical life. Why? He wanted to go and be with the Lord. He wanted to go and to be with Christ. That's what he stated also to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 and 23. He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To die is gain? Yes. Because he would be with Christ. 
He went on to say, I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Far better, yes. Far better than anything that we could experience in this life. To be with Christ, to look upon His face, to be able to spend eternity with Him in heaven. We read in Revelation chapter 22, verses 3 and 4, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it that is in heaven, and His servants shall serve Him, and they shall see His face. Think about it. They, that is His servants, shall see His face. Oh, how we long for that day. But heaven will also be a better place because there will be no sorrow in heaven. You know, tears are the common lot of humanity. The Bible states in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this come a judgment. And we read of the first death recorded in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 8, when Cain killed his brother Abel. Don't you know that that caused a great degree of heartache to his parents, to Adam and Eve, to suffer loss for the very first time, to suffer the death of a child. How it brought heartache and heartbreak to them. And we have experienced the same thing. We have lost loved ones who have been dear to us and whom we have cherished all of our lives. And we've had to say goodbye to those who were dear to our hearts. And we also know that one day we ourselves will pass through that valley of the shadow of death and there will be others left behind to mourn our passing and to grieve at the loss that they are suffering at that moment in time. But think of the comfort that we find from the Word of God regarding the city of heaven. John writes in Revelation 21 and verse 4, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. No more death, no more sad and heartbreaking farewells. No longer and never again will we have to say goodbye to a loved one. The Apostle Paul suffered a great deal in this physical life and he wrote these words in Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And in these writings of the Apostle Paul, you can certainly see that he longed to be away from this life because he would be with the Lord. He longed to spend eternity in that place the Bible calls heaven. But heaven will also be a better place because there will be no sin in heaven. You can turn on the television and watch the, uh, the news each day. You can pick up the daily newspaper and read about things that are happening and so many different kinds of evil and wickedness, sinfulness of every kind is taking place in our society but it was also taking place in first century society. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Know ye not that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, that is, homosexuals, nor covetous, nor thieves, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. These will not be in heaven. Those who have lived wickedly in this life will not be there. John writes in Revelation chapter 21 in verse 8, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars will have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Sin has marred the lives of countless individuals throughout the centuries. It has marred the happiness and marred families 
family after family throughout generations, in heaven there will be no sin, no sinfulness of any kind. John writes in Revelation 21 in verse 27, And there shall in no wise enter into it that is into heaven anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. No sin in heaven. But then heaven will be a better place because of the wonderful reunions that we will enjoy with faithful loved ones who have gone on before us. Sometimes the question is asked, will we know one another in heaven? My friends, the Bible answers with a resounding yes. Identity is retained after death. In Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 5, we read of Moses and Elijah appearing on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus Christ. And keep in mind that it had been hundreds of years since Elijah had ascended up into heaven in the chariot of fire. And it had been hundreds of years since Moses himself had suffered physical death. And yet they still retained their identities. Moses was still Moses and Elijah was still Elijah. In Luke chapter 16, beginning with verse 19, we read of the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And Lazarus, even though he was dead, was still Lazarus. He had retained his identity. And in the Old Testament, in 1 Samuel chapter 28, we read of when God allowed the spirit of Samuel to return to tell King Saul of his impending doom. And note, if you will, that Samuel was still recognizable. He retained his identity after death. He was still Samuel. Look at these scriptures in Genesis 25 and verse 8. We read something about Abraham. Abraham of the Old Testament, the father of the faithful. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Think about that. He was gathered to his people. He went to be with his people. And we read in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 33 that when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the ghost and was gathered to his people. Oh, how comforting those scriptures are. To be able to enjoy a reunion with loved ones who have gone on before us. To be reunited once again. Heaven will be a better place. Think of the reward. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 8. Keep in mind, this is just a short time before his own death. He says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, but not to me only, but unto all them that loveth his appearing. And Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 5, in verse 4, that when the chief shepherd shall appear, you sh ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. You know, many people are interested in inheritances in, in this life. Things that are, will be bequeathed to them after loved ones have already died. Well, we read about an inheritance reserved for Christians, for faithful Christians. Listen to what Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. An inheritance that will be far, far more wonderful and valuable than anything that we could ever receive in this physical life. Think for just a moment about the wonderful prospect of standing before Jesus Christ and hearing Him say, Come, ye blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Matthew 25 
in verse 34. You think of joyful events in this physical life, some of the happiest times that you've enjoyed, they cannot compare with the joy and the happiness that will flood your soul as you hear those wonderful words come from our Savior. We read in the Old Testament in Psalm 116 and verse 15, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Precious? Yes. But not everyone's death is considered to be precious by the Lord. Only the death of His people. Only the death of a faithful child of God is considered to be precious. Precious because we will see Christ. Precious because there will be no more sorrow. Precious because there will be no more sin. Precious because we will be reunited with faithful loved ones. Think of heaven. Our heart sings at the prospect of seeing and knowing such great men of God, prophets such as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, David, the sweet singer of Israel. And add to that the wonderful prospect of seeing our dear loved ones in their immortal state, no longer weary and sad, no longer worn and sick, no longer clothed in bodies weak with pain and ravaged by disease. My friends, we can confidently expect to walk with, mingle with, and converse with those whom we have loved and lost in a land where hand clasp and greetings will be far warmer, far sweeter than any that we've ever experienced in this life, in the land that is fairer than day. Heaven will be a better place. But heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Let me tell you something, my friends. If we go to heaven, it will be because we have prepared to go there. Paul wrote to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27, about their becoming children of God. He said, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And we read in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You must obey the gospel. You must become a New Testament Christian. You must live for Christ. You must be obedient to Him. You must be faithful until death. And as you go through life, looking forward to that great, great day when we stand before the Lord, oh, how we long to hear those wonderful words. Enter thou into the joys of thy Lord. Heaven will be a better place. It's my prayer that this study will have been a great, great benefit to all those viewing it. Thank you so much.